If I've not had the opportunity to meet you, my name's Ray. I'm one of the pastors here. And if uh, you're new or newer to Abundant Life and uh, we haven't met, I would love to just talk with you for a few minutes after the service, get to know you, hear your story, know how I can be praying for you this week. But thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And if you can't tell, this is not my normal voice. Allergies have hit me. Uh, Friday night, we went to our son's football game and I, I literally lost my voice like completely. And so yesterday, Carol's like, you have to like do everything. I was just sucking on like lozenges and drinking tea. And she's like, you can't talk. And I'm not sure if that was for me or for her, but either way, we'll just say it was for me. All right. And we'll, we'll just let me live in that fantasy. Um, but if my voice goes or I crack, I have actually gone through the stages of life already. I just, uh, this, it just might happen. I'm warning you about this. Um, but I'm excited to talk about what we're going to be sharing today. And to start, I want to actually share the question that I've been asked more than any other question in 20 plus years of ministry. This is easily some form, some fashion, this question I've been asked. And it's, it's a really important question. It's a good question to be asking. And the question is this, what is God's will for my life? Now, it might sound like, what's God's purpose for my life? What does God want me to do? Who does God want me to be? Who does God want me to marry? What job does God want me to have? Where does he want me to live? But it's some form of what is God's will for my life. And here's what I've learned is oftentimes we're so fixated on God's will because we think, well, if I know God's will, then I'll just do process A, B, and C, and then I'll get the outcome I want. How many know that life is not linear? Is, I would like it to be because I am a linear thinker. That's how my mind works. And so it upsets me when life is not always linear. But this is our life. It's filled with unforeseen, unforeseen twists and turns. And it can be a challenge as we, we prepare to walk through this process that God calls transformation. And this is really our, our theme, like Pastor Ron was saying. It's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Not just for us as a church, but also for us as a school in the child care center. I had the opportunity to speak to them the other day. And it was absolutely amazing. But as I was thinking about transformation, I was thinking about butterflies. In fact, one of my very first memories, a core memory, if you will, is when I was a young kid. I must have been four or five years old. And I remember that we had this neighbor girl next door that I would always go play with. Her name was Megan. And between our homes, we had a chain link fence and there were bushes and plants on each side of that fence. And one day I went over to Megan's house to play and we noticed that there on one of the bushes was a caterpillar and it was in the beginning stages of, you know, a chrysalis going into the cocoon. And so every now and again, we would go and we would check on this caterpillar to see where it was at. And eventually it was fully immersed in this cocoon. And then one day we went out there and the cocoon was open and there, were butter, there was a butterfly flying around. It probably wasn't the butterfly in that cocoon, but we pretended that it was, right? Every butterfly we saw, oh, that's the butterfly that we saw. It was an amazing thing. I was like, wow, this is so cool. And, and I'm going to ask you a question here and I need you just to, to remember, I'm a little bit strange and odd, but it got me thinking this week. Have you ever thought about that process from the perspective of the caterpillar? I mean, what it would be like to be a little caterpillar and you're, you're walking around, you're crawling around and you go through this molting process and you shed your skin and you see other bigger caterpillars and you think one day I'll be like that caterpillar. That's going to be amazing. But you never look in the sky and see a butterfly and say, you know, what? one day I'm going to be like that butterfly. You would be crazy. All the caterpillars would be like, yo, bro, just chill out, man. Like that's a little bit wild. What are you thinking here? But then one day you find yourself going up into a bush and you're, you attach yourself to it. You begin this cocoon process, this chrysalis process, this metamorphosis, this transformation. And eventually you come out and you're this beautiful butterfly. But what if you could still remember? What if the caterpillar could still remember that it was just a caterpillar even though it had the body of a butterfly? And so instead of soaring around and exploring the world and discovering new things, it just crawled on the ground like it always had. See, this is where I think a lot of Christians get stuck. They have a butterfly body, but all they know is crawling in the caterpillar life. Second Corinthians, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We're made a new creation, 
But sometimes we don't experience the benefits of that new life. And I believe that God has so much more for us today. See, heaven can be our home, but I believe that God wants to make heaven in our heart. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you're like, I want to know God's will because I know there's more. But how do I find that more? Well, I, I want to encourage you, if, if you're maybe struggling in that area, you're asking that question, that they're actually asking a good question. Because you feel caught in this in-between of where you are and where God wants you to be. And you're like, God, how do I close that gap? That's a great question to be asking. Because I believe that's actually the Holy Spirit prompting you to the more that God has for you. But the, the second encouragement I want to give you is this. And it's found in the book of Romans, in Paul's letter to the Roman church in Romans 12, what Christina just read. But I want to reread it here again as we, we kind of focus on this. It says this, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. And I'm going to pause here for a moment. What is God's mercy that Paul is talking about as he's writing to this church? Well, he actually outlines all these mercies in chapters 1 through 11. Because it's there that we see that we were condemned by sin. That there was a death sentence on our life. But we were made right or righteous because of Jesus. That we were justified by faith. That we have access to God. That heaven is our home and we have hope because of that. That no matter what we're going through, the purpose, the struggles, the, the things we wrestle with in life, that there is purpose in the midst of all that he talks about in chapter 5. That we were slaves who have been freed, freed from the law and sin, that we've been adopted into the family of God, grafted in, that the Holy Spirit lives and resides inside of us. And then he speaks some specific promises to the Jewish nation. He talks about the inclusion of all of us as, as Gentiles, many people here today, showing his divine faithfulness to us all. So he says, in view of all of those things, then here's what I'm asking you to do. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. And by that way, by the way, th that word transformed, it's actually the, in the Greek, it's metamorphosis. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. So be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for every person who's here today. Lord, I'm sure with this many people here, there are people who are maybe wrestling with what is God's will for my life? What does God want me to do in this season of my life? And Lord, I pray that you would, through the power of your Holy Spirit, encourage them that you would reveal yourself to them, and that you would teach us to walk in and to live in your good, pleasing, and perfect will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And by the way, when I preach, just so you know, you can talk back at me. I like it. You can say, even if it's not that good of a point, you can just say, amen, good, preach it. That's good. You know, like, I like that stuff, so don't feel like you're stepping on anybody's toes. It's all good. Uh, but I mentioned in Romans 1 through 11 that it reveals the mercies of God. But we see a distinct shift as we move into chapter 12. And you can think of it this way. We're moving from the classroom to the comm commencement ceremony. The classroom to the commencement ceremony. All of this learning is preparation for the people to be able to step out into the world and now go live all these truths that you have learned. And in this graduation speech, Paul gives us distinct instruction to live out our calling and ultimately to live in the will and the purpose that God has created us for. And I want to share three things that I have, three, three takeaways, if you will. Number one, we start by presenting our bodies, if you're taking notes, presenting our bodies. This is what call, Paul called being a living sacrifice. Verse 1, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Listen, if you want to worship God rightly, there is a right way to worship God. Sometimes we say there's no right way to worship God. There, there is actually a right way. If you want to worship God rightly, then it requires us to offer our body wholly. God doesn't, uh, sometimes we think, well, it's just about, you know, what I feel or my inside. That's all God cares. No, God actually cares about what we do with our life and with our body. We can't pick and choose what areas we're going to give to God. It's not a buffet, right? We can't give God our time and then say, but God, I'm not going to give you my talent. Or God, I'm going to give you my, my work, but I'm not going to give you my wallet. 
I know you're not supposed to talk about money in church, but come on now. You know it's true. It's hard sometimes. God, how do I? I'm looking at my bank account. How do I trust you in this? A caterpillar can't experience the beauty of being a butterfly if it just yields part of itself to that chrysalis process. It's got to give its entirety. Parts of it literally dissolve, by the way, in that process so that it can be reborn, transformed, go through that metamorphosis. This is the idea of when we die to self, that now we find life in Christ. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, meaning that it's no longer about him, but it was about Jesus. I'm not sure about you, but sometimes I struggle with this type of process. Paul actually says, I, I struggle too. If you go back in Romans 7, he says in verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I'm like, yes, Paul, thank you. I understand this language. Paul's actually describing one of the challenges of being a living sacrifice. See, in the Bible, before Jesus died, there were sacrifices that would be given by the people or the priests presented to God as an offering. But here's the thing, those sacrifices were always dead, so they couldn't really move off that altar. But as a living sacrifice, we tend to squirm and crawl away. We're like, God, I want to do it. Nah, maybe not. Anyone ever had one of those days? You're praying in the car. This is going to be a great start to my week. Somebody cuts you off, and you remind them that they're number one. I mean, just, right? We tell our kids to be patient and kind. Things don't go their way. And then the Pats throw another interception, and we lose our mind. We keep arguing with our spouse when we know that we should apologize. Now, that one, I've never actually had that issue. I just, I'm a pastor, and I counsel a lot of people, and they tell me things, and so I, you know, sometimes that happens. But this is a challenge of our humanity, right? It's the combination of what the Bible calls the flesh as well as sin that's entered into the world, Satan, our enemy. Our selfish desires and our wants don't want to die on that altar. They want to get up. They want to resurrect. But this is exactly what must happen in order for us to discover God's will, to be able to live in God's will. And here's where I think some Christians miss it. Because when we talk about works, they say, well, I'm not saved by works. I, 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 don't, I don't have a relationship with God because of what, what, what we do. And you're right. In fact, I'll read it. Ephesians 2.8. Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Absolutely dead on your right. But let me be clear. While we are not saved by our actions, when we are saved our actions will change because the Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we could not do, what we did not have the capacity for in ourselves. We are transformed. We are no longer our own, and because we belong to him, we are live differently because of that. And so maybe you're, you're there and you're... You hear that little bit of crack? That's what I'm talking about. Maybe you're here... And you, you're, you're not getting the results you want in your life. I would, I would encourage you to ask yourself this question. Are you trying to present your body as a living sacrifice, but instead of yielding to the Holy Spirit, you're actually trying to make that effort and that endeavor on your own in your own strength? Because here's what happens. We can, be, we can modify our behavior, but behavior modification doesn't equal life transformation. If we try to do it on our own, it comes across as a facade of religion, but it's absent of meaningful relationship. It's this cheap facsimile. It lacks authenticity. It looks good from afar, but the closer you get, the more problems you begin to see. See, this is essentially willpower, and willpower is a finite tool. It has its limitations, but the Holy Spirit is infinite, and he will help you to do what might seem impossible in your own strength because his power knows no bounds. If you're struggling to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, can I just encourage you today? Tap into the source of power found in the person of the Holy Spirit. But there's another essential component of discovering God's will for your life. Not only do we present our bodies to God to be used by him as a living sacrifice, but we also focus on renewing our minds. 
This is what we, we might call the pathway to transformation, if you will. Romans 12, 2, the first part says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, there's two parts of this sentence. There's a negative, do not conform, and the positive, be transformed. Let's start with the negative. Paul's talking about the world here. He says the pattern of this world. What, what's he really mean by that? Well, John begins to illuminate. We read in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Can I just read that one more time? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. You need to understand the system of the world and the cross are diametrically opposed to one another. They are on opposite ends of the spectrum. There is no fitting Christ into this little box that we call the world. He says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world is a system or a way of life that is set in opposition to God. It isn't just seen with the eyes, by the way, but it has to be discerned with the Spirit of God. Have you ever looked at something and known that it's so clearly obvious that this is diametrically opposed to God, and yet people can't seem to see it? And you're like, why can they not see it? Because it has to be discerned. The Spirit has to show you and reveal to you what seems obvious to you has not been revealed to them because it has to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. John points out the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and you could preach messages on all of those. But in essence, the world is wanting you to take hold of a life that God is actually calling you to let go of. And it reminds me of a story I once heard about how trappers would actually used to, they used to catch monkeys. And what they would do is they would take this, this fruit, it's called the calabash. And there's different, different shapes of calabash, but it's this hard kind of greenish fruit. You can kind of think almost of a green coconut looking thing. And what they would do is they would tie this calabash to a tree, right? Somewhere where they, it couldn't be removed. And then they would take a little hole at the top of it and they would cut it in there and then they would drop some fruit inside of it. And then the monkey would come along and it would reach in its little hand. It's just big enough for the hole to fit its hand in and it would grab the fruit. The problem was when the monkey went to try and pull its hand out because it, it was holding on to the fruit, it couldn't let go. And all the trapper would do is just walk up to this monkey, throw a net over it or throw a bag over it, and it would be trapped. The monkey thought that it was going to get something, but the thing that it actually thought was that it needed was actually a thing that trapped it, that kept it. We must learn to let go of our old ways, our old ways of being, of thinking, if we're going to take hold of the freedom that Christ has for us. To die is gain. To live is Christ, right? We must refuse to conform, to be put in a box determined by this world. You know what's always so funny to me is people say, well, I'm going to be my own individual. And I always think, you know what? No, you're just into the box that the world's created for you. True freedom can only be found in Christ. I promise you there is not a freedom that this world can provide you that is lasting or meaningful. As Christ followers, our desire is to be changed and used by God. And this brings us face to face with this reality. The life you have is a reflection of the thoughts you think. The life you have, it is a reflection of the thoughts you think. And if this is true, then what we put into our mind is paramount. So the psalmist said in Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know what this tells me? If you don't hide God's word in your heart, you will sin against God. It's just, it's just a matter of time. It's going to happen. Listen, even with God's word, we can struggle and wrestle with sin. But without God's word, we have no shot. A bit later in verse 105, he says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light to my path. God's word illuminates, it shows you. Sometimes we want to take this leap of faith, but God actually just calls us to take a step of faith. And so when we walk in faith, believing with God's word before us, we can say, okay, God, I don't know, I don't know the whole story, but I know this next step is on sure footing because this next step's with you, because your word is guiding me. 
If you are walking around without God's word in your heart or God's word actively at work in your life, you are walking around in darkness and who knows what's out there in the darkness ahead. Romans 10, 17, so the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to have faith in your life, then don't just read the Bible. Can I encourage you to write some verses down, memorize them, and then say them out loud. Speak them over your life. It's God's word that speaks ultimate truth over your life, reveals God's power to break the hold of sin, and shares God's promises of who you are in Christ. God's word is the revealing of who Christ is and provides for us the secret to this transformative power. This is our metamorphosis, so to speak. In the Bible, you'll see that God has made you for more. You weren't meant to crawl. You were meant to soar with purpose. His word reveals that you are saved by grace, Ephesians 2.8. You're a child of God, John 1.12. You're a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. You are chosen by God, 1 Peter 2.9. You're the apple of his eye, Deuteronomy 32.10. You are loved by God, 1 John 3.1. Ephesians 1.7 says you are forgiven, Romans 6.22. You are freed from sin, Ephesians 1.3. You are blessed. You are a friend of Jesus, John 15, 15. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, Matthew 5, 13 and 14. You are more than a conqueror through Christ, Romans 8, 37. You are an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony, Revelation 12, 11. Church, you are made for more. Oh, I think we can do better than that. You are made for more, church. You don't have to live this timid, limited life. You've got a story to tell because of who Christ is inside of you. And you can live with boldness and courage. You say, but Ray, that's not my personality. See, Christ transcends our personality. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit at work in us. He's not limited by what we can do and who we are, but we have access to everything that he can do through us. It's where you can find courage, the abundance of his grace, love, and forgiveness. You have a story to tell, and others need to hear it, church, but it all starts by what you put into your mind. The voices we listen to matter because what's in your head affects what's in your heart. My youth pastor used to say this phrase that got stuck in my head. He said, garbage in, garbage out. Anyone ever heard that? Garbage in, garbage out. If you feed on a steady diet of social media, in the news, you might turn a little bit negative. If you're constantly around complainers, don't be too shocked when your spirit becomes critical. I've noticed a pattern that's held true in my life. Like spirits tend to gather. Be careful who you surround yourself with. And I don't say this to mean that you need to avoid all people, but what I do say is, is be, a, be very careful who you allow access to your heart influence in your, in your mind and in your life. As a Christian, then, we understand that when truth is planted in our mind and our heart, then transformation can come out. So how do we get that truth into our lives? I kind of already talked about it a little bit, but these are not, it's not a sexy list, but this is a real list because this is the basic foundation. I'm not going to list everything, but number one, study your Bible. Don't just read it, by the way. Study it. If you study two verses for 10 minutes and get something out of it, that's awesome. It's better than speed reading four chapters so you can check it off the list and tell somebody about it. Two verses that actually speaks to you is amazing. Celebrate that. Think of it kind of like a workout. You might not get as many reps in by doing it the right way, but you'll get a lot better results. Another way to get truth into your lives is connecting with God in prayer. And by the way, when you pray, Yes, bring your petitions and your needs and thank God for all he's done, but take time in that prayer time to listen. And you might say, well, Ray, I don't even know if this is my voice or this is God's voice. Here's how you learn to hear God's voice. Read his word. And then when you read his word, you'll know what God's voice sounds like. God's voice won't condemn you. It won't beat you up. It will convict you. It will challenge you. It will change you. And so allow God's voice to speak to you. Build that connection with him in prayer. And we also find truth by surrounding ourselves with others, other Christ followers. Get around people who are growing and glean wisdom from them. People who encourage you, people who challenge you, people, listen, who tell you what you need to hear, not just what you want to hear. Amen? I know. But listen, I don't want to go to the doctor 
and, they, and I, he sees I have high blood pressure, and he's like, Ray, everything's good. Don't worry about it. Just keep eating what you're eating. Keep doing what you're doing. Like, that doesn't help me change, right? I need truth because that truth will be helpful. And sometimes we need friends that we give permission to speak the truth into our lives. If we want to discover God's will, it requires truth. Truth in, transformation out. What's in your head affects what's in your heart. And this is crucial and leads us to our last point. Number three, discerning and doing God's will. And I cheated here because I put two things. But this is the result of renewal. And I put two things because they really go hand in hand. So if what's in your head affects what's in your heart, then understand this other truth. What lives in your heart will eventually come out of your life. It's just a matter of time. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, the Bible says. Proverbs 29, 27, 19 says it this way. As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. Have you ever done something and thought, how could I have done that? It's because somewhere along the line, it had time to be cultivated in our heart. And before that, there was a thought they hit our mind. And so it's very important that we understand this. I love what W. Edwards Deming said. He said, your system is perfectly designed to give you the results you're getting. Let me say this another way. Your life is perfectly designed to give you the results you're getting. If there are aspects of your life that you do not like, then look at the system you've built your life upon. See, to discern or discover God's will requires us to build our life on the truth of who God is. And this is a prerequisite to get into the class. You, you can't bypass this one. You can't test out of it. This has to happen. But the next step to discovering God's will is to actually do God's will. And you're like, well, Ray, how do I do God's will if I don't know what God's will is? Well, there's good news here. Because there actually are some things that we know as followers of Jesus that we should do. We know that we should put God first, right? That's why we, our first part of our mission is love God. We know that we should love the people around us, love others, right? Our family, our friends, our enemies, right? Like Pastor Ron was saying, to love everyone. This is who God has called us to love. We know that we can't do this on our own, that we need others, so we should gather together. We can do this at church. We can do this in our small groups that are coming up. This is a great way. We know that we should give our best in our job because it's not, we're not just working for our boss. We're working unto the Lord, right? So we're bringing our best. We know we should do all these things. This is the will of God. I truly believe the key to unlocking what's in the future is being faithful in the present. So often our eyes are fixed on the future that we forget to be faithful in the here and now. On the other side of your current faithfulness are not only the blessings of God, but the will of God. And just to be clear, God's will for your life is actually just God's will. And God's will involves us, but can I tell you something? I don't want to break your hearts today, but it's not about us. We are not the main character in this story. I hate to break it to you here today. God doesn't exist just to do our will. We exist to do God's will. Our heart and our mission should be to do whatever God asks us in order to bring glory and honor to him because his call is bigger than any one of us. See, what the caterpillar doesn't realize is that its transformation will allow it to not only discover a new life for itself, but to bring life to others. See, it's going to go and it's going to pollinate plants and that's pollination is going to help to provide food so other animals, other people can actually sustain their life. And did you know that when you see butterflies in an environment, it's actually an indicator of the health of that environment? And this isn't even speaking to the beauty that a butterfly can bring. See, God wants to be able to transform you, not just so you can experience blessing, which he does, but also because he has a purpose for your life to help others experience his blessing. God blesses you to be a blessing, to bring glory to him. So ask yourself this question, is my presence in my home, is my presence in my school, is my presence in my workplace, is my presence in my community, is it bringing health and beauty to the people around me? The bottom line is this, a transformed mind will produce a transformed life. 
I heard someone say the next statement, uh, this next statement I'm about to read once, and I so wanted to argue. In fact, I said it to Carol the other day, and she's like, that can't be right. That can't be right. They said this. They said, I'm going to say a statement, and I'm going to give you permission to do this. Love God and do whatever you want. Is there like this visceral reaction that you want to say, that can't be right? That can't be right, right? Love God and do whatever I want. That's crazy talk. Well, let me read Psalm 37.4. Delight yourself in the Lord. Love God, and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, when, when you love God, when, you're, when your will aligns with his, it's not really about your will. It's about his. So when you truly love God with all that's in you, with, every, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you can do what you want because what you want is actually what the Lord wants. See, when it comes to knowing God's will for your life, I tend to believe that it's not this always this exclusive binary option. You have two great job offers. Could it be that God is going to allow you to use the wisdom that he's given you and the unique desires that he's made you with to make a choice? And whatever choice you make, God's will will be accomplished in your life and you will honor him with that? I actually think that's possible. Now, does God know what you're going to do? Sure, he does. But I, I believe that God gives us this partnership and this relationship because he's revealing his heart to us. And I hope this helps some of you who are maybe out there saying, well, what's God want me to do in this little decision? I can't make a wrong decision because if I do this thing, then somehow I'm not going to honor God. I believe that if your heart truly is set on him, if your word, his word is before you, if the Holy Spirit is residing in you, that he will give you the wisdom, the strength, and the people around you to help you make the right decision. See, when you truly put God first, he will guide you to his heart. And when you have his heart, you will be who you, he wants you to be. You will want what he wants you to want, and you will do what he wants you to do. So can I just encourage you today to stop crawling Stop living small and timid and limited. Start soaring. Start exploring the world that God has for you. God wants you to fly so you can do so much more than you could ever think was possible. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to come and gather today. Lord, and I pray that our hearts would be challenged by this word. Not just challenge to go out and do more, but Lord, to really surrender completely and fully to you because that's what it takes. And Lord, as we surrender to you, then we discover this amazing power through the Holy Spirit that is available to us in our lives. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here and that you are empowering us. And Lord, I just ask that you would be with everyone here today and help them. And I just pause for a moment to ask this question with every head bowed and every eye closed. Is there anyone here today and you'd say, you know what? I, I, I've been wrestling, Ray, with what, what does God want me to do or how do I do the things that I feel like God wants me to do? And I just, I just would so appreciate if you would pray for me because I need God's help to do that. I want to take a step of faith, but, but I'm scared or I'm unsure. Is there anyone here, if you just be bold enough to raise your hand, I'd love to just pray for you. We're not going to embarrass anyone, but that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Thank you so much for your honesty. Amen. Amen. Several hands. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that you brought us all here for a reason today, that we are not here by accident. Lord, I just ask for those who raise their hand and maybe for those who are just afraid to. Lord, I pray that you give them wisdom God, to walk in your will and to walk in your way. Lord, let us, let us trust you today, God, fully. God, I pray that as we trust you fully, we would see amazing things happen, not only in our life, but in the life of this church. God, let this church be a beacon of light and hope to this community. Let us impact the world that you have called us to and placed us in, I pray this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.